things most of you probably don't know is most of my preaching is at me. You just get to listen to what God's working out in my life. You're just hanging along. You're just eavesdropping on what God's talking to me about. My heart is for revival. My heart is for revival for the church, for the community. But you know what? As often as not, it's, it's as much for me. God, revive my heart. There's Sundays I can stand before you and I feel a little sheepish about preaching as I may be on a subject that I still haven't got total of hold of yet myself. The last couple Sundays we've been preaching on the importance of a verbal proclamation of God's promises, a strong rebuttal when the enemy attacks. Can I tell you, I practice that, but not near as often as I can. I catch myself whining and complaining rather than working it. Oh, I don't know why things are so tough. I don't know why this and that. And, and, and I'm not using God's word and his promises like I should. At times I entertain fears while at the same time preaching that faith is the opposite of fear. I teach on trusting God in all things, but you know what? I keep a pretty close eye on my bank account balance. And I sometimes measure myself, my own worth, by that account. I fought, uh, struggle and fail at the same time as preaching victory in Jesus. See, I have a certain comfortableness with proclaiming the Word of God and yet at the same time I look in the mirror and I go, Lord, yeah, but I could use a little bit more or sometimes more than a little bit more of that myself. And then I have my uncertainty and my own insecurities that I go through and then I, you know, I say, God, am I really the one you can use? And then I remember some scripture. Philippians 3, 12 through 14, the Apostle Paul says this, Not that I've already obtained, or I'm already perfect, but I press on that I may hold of that which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. In other words, I lay hold of everything that Christ has already put out there for me. Brethren, I do not count myself to apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press to the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I guess if the Apostle Paul can admit to it not quite being there yet, then certainly I can even more so. So we look to the author of our faith, the author and finisher of our, of our faith, and we say, thank you, God. Thank you for calling me. Thank you for saving me. And thank you, Lord, that you're persevering in my life to keep me on the track. I'm not content to stay the same. I hope you aren't either. God has called us all to a life of growth. We have to fight that instinct to make our faith equal to our experience and our failures, even to the church itself here. God is not valuing us this day because of how many empty pews. We are not valued this day on our power and our authority because we do not fill the place. We have to look beyond what we can see and see through God's eyes. As I cry out for more of God in my life and in my church and I, in my community, I believe that's God's call on us all. For He wants more of us so that He can give us more. And He can do more through us. See, we live in a time, maybe the first time ever, you folks that are older than me by a little bit, remember a, a different time. Do you ever remember it being me first as much as it is now? My pursuit of happiness, my quest to make money, my ambitions, my purpose. It's 
It's all about me. And God would call us all into this big banquet. The scripture uses that story, and we say, well, I guess I've got a lot of things to do. I can't come right now. I've got important stuff, God. We used to sing a song when I was a kid. I cannot come. I cannot come to the banquet. Don't bother me now. I've married a wife. Bought me a cow. I've got fields and commitments that cost a hefty sum. Don't bother me now. I cannot come. Anybody else know that song? <laughs> you didn't join me, you potheads. <laughs> One of the things I can remember, the stuff I can't absolutely think a word of. So, anyhow, to placate that growing materialism and humanism in our time, the church has subtly changed our message. We see the empty pews and the few that are seeking, and we say, how do we make this easier for them to come in? Come in! Come in! Come to Jesus and he'll make your life better because life is better with Jesus. And I want to tell you that's an absolute truth. Life is better with Jesus, but it's only part of the message. What's happening is we're developing a generation of Christians that think this life is all about them and they see Jesus as just an, a positive add-on to an already full life. Oh, they may have experienced some change, but only as a subtext to their life. And I'm not making any judgments about whether or not people are getting saved nowadays. I'm not even saying I know what a life looks totally sold out for Jesus Christ in our culture. I don't even know what that looks like for sure. We are to work. We are to look after our families. And it's not wrong to take some time to enjoy the fruits of our labor and enjoy the great creation God has given us. So we don't want to walk around wallowing around in guilt. Am I doing enough? What is God saying? Blah, 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 blah. All I'm saying is this morning, as I go through this message, talk to God a little. Quietly ask God, if you really are the Lord of my life, would my life be different? Would my thinking be different? What does living a Christ, uh, living in Christ really mean? And I want to tell you, that is hard for me to proclaim from here because it'll look different for all of us because Christ has made us all individuals. God has created us all as individuals. And as soon as the church gets going, well, this is what you got to do, and Tuesday looks like this, and Wednesday looks like this, and Thursday looks like this, then we get in all sorts of problems. Then we're back to that legalism thing. Turn with me to Matthew this morning. Matthew 13, 44 through 46. Matthew 13, starting at 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant or the, on the lookout for a choice pearl. When he discovers a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and he bought it. It's interesting, in a life full, a culture full of life for the taking, where we enjoy wealth still like only few in the world can understand. You know, my poor, my worst day financially is still better than some people can dream about their best day. That's just a reality. But in our wealth, that we would look at it and say, my goodness, everything that I have, on this, every scrap that I could bundle up, I would put a big bow on it and trade it for Jesus. Now, 
We have a parable today. It's, it's a story to tell us a truth. That's what Jesus made these little stories. They were to express truth. And this truth today is about the value of who God is and the kingdom and that gift to us. First of all, we have uh, two examples. Two people looking, seeking, eyes open, perhaps seeing what others cannot see. You know, when I bought my old home and we stripped it down to the bare walls, uh, Lauren and I kind of dreamed about the idea of finding some treasure. This is an older home, and we've all heard the stories of the treasures in the attics or the treasures in between the boards that somebody put in a couple generations ago. I mean, wouldn't it be cool? I mean, if you found a priceless painting or just a tin cup full of gold coins, all of that would have been quite helpful. Thank you very much. So we tore the house apart and we kept our eyes open. In anticipation of this prize that we might find. Well, we found our prize was only hard labor, and the prize was just the house itself. But I want to ask you this morning, imagine walking across your neighbor's field, and there's a rock outcropping or what looks like that, and they've just gone around it for years, and perhaps they've dumped other rocks on it, it's just never been looked at. And you just go take a look. And you're looking for different things. You're wondering what the rocks are and you're rolling them back a little and all of a sudden you find this little opening. You start moving the dirt back a little and roll a couple rocks back a little bit. And you wiggle in and get your flashlight and take a look what's in there. Well, okay, maybe it's dangerous. So you'd send a kid to wiggle in with a flashlight to see what's in there. No, that's not right either. Anyhow, what you find is a hole full of gold and gems. Who knows how they got there? Who knows why they were put there? All you know is nobody else knows but you. But now, here's where I have a little problem with this story. Because to me, ethically speaking, I mean, I want this quarter. I, I, I now want this land badly. Uh, I may want to borrow and whatever you might do to get the money to get that. But I think maybe I'd feel honor bound at least afterwards to give a little bit back to the previous owner. But that not change anything. I want this land. Likewise, the merchant who is buying and selling and always on the lookout for a prize gem, a pearl of untold value, and he knows what he's looking for. And he just keeps his eyes open all the time, and suddenly his eyes come upon this gem, and he sells everything he has to buy it. You know what? Both stories are about finding a treasure that's worth everything you have. And what Jesus is saying is, I have a prize like that for you. Let's make a trade. A prize that will cost you everything. In fact, unlike our parables, the truth is the prize will cost us more than we could ever pay. It will cost ourselves, and even at that, it will be a great bargain. How much does it cost if you look to our perfect example who gave his life, Jesus? He gave it all so that we could have new life. This thing that he wants to give us is very, very precious. He bore the cross for our sakes to win us back from serving sin and self. And a message that doesn't get preached much in our day is that a call to those who say, yes, Jesus, it is pick up your cross and follow in my footsteps. Baptism is a picture of ourselves dying and we're being raised up to new life. Today, in our efforts to make Christianity more accessible, we have sold Jesus for too low of a price. We've said, come and try Jesus. 
See how he helps you with your old life. I want to tell you that's not scriptural. What does he want to do with the old life? He wants to kill it. So that we could be raised up free and powerful with the authority that he's won on the cross. And I think because of our willingness to tell the whole story that this life in Christ has sacrifice and this life in Christ has cost, we have a lot of Christians out there who are discouraged, disappointed, and delusioned. Disillusioned. They wanted the best from their Lord and yet have never been told about giving their best. They have the kind of faith that serves them as long as it serves them. When it gets hard or calls for personal sacrifice, they think, boy, that's not supposed to be how this works. This is about for me. God's Word is a loosely held guidebook in many Christians' hands today. And they get so frustrated because I get to make my own decisions. I read kind of this and I know it says this, but I'm doing this. And when things go horribly wrong, they go, what happened, God? You failed me. A call to Christ isn't just come and get him to forgive your sins. It's to follow him. He is the way the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except by Him. And I want to tell you, it is fitting that it costs, that there's a price. David was going to make a sacrifice. King David was going to make a sacrifice. And he didn't have anything. And somebody came along and said, well, let me give you an animal so you can sacrifice. And David said, no, I will not make a sacrifice to my Lord that doesn't cost me anything. This might seem like a hard message this morning, but here's the punchline. Hear this. Here, this is what it's all about. I get to trade all I have and all I will ever be for all he has and all I can be in him. And I want to tell you folks, it's still a no-brainer. Without Christ, Christ, I was lost in my sin, bound for an unspeakable eternity. Without Christ, I was... I had no hope for today or tomorrow. Without Christ, I had no help or peace when life gets unfair and it gets tough. Without Christ, I was sold out to Satan and I had no authority over that harsh and cruel taskmaster. With Christ, I have the promise that the yoke will be easy and the burden is light. And I love the picture of a yoke because it means I'm putting on something, I'm pulling my weight and everything else, and I look over and who's in the yoke beside me? It's my Jesus. He's pulling along beside me. We have sold ourselves and others short when you say, when we say, just try Jesus a little and it'll be okay. We have lied when we say you can call him Lord and Savior of your life, but you still get to have the controls of your life. By doing that, we've created weak and unvictorian, unvictorious Christians who will never understand that to totally sell out to God through Jesus is the only way to the fullness of his plan for your life. There are no shortcuts. We give our best to God, not our leftovers. And he gives us his best. That's the trade, folks. God is great. The ministry of Jesus Christ was free. He came freely to die for us in our place. But his call on our lives is not free. Yes, we receive the gift of salvation, but we actually turn our hearts and our lives over to him. Do you know what? You can have a faith in Jesus Christ not only worth living for, but enough that you would die for it. And I don't know how many of us in North America have a feeling of that. 
I am so strong in my commitment to Jesus Christ, if it costs my life, I would give it. Other places in the world are, used, are having that test. Lord forbid that we ever have it, but perhaps we need a little test here to see who's really on board. We're going to go to communion this morning. We thank God for what he's done. We thank God for what he's doing. Do you know the blood of Christ is still as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago? It's still relevant if you receive Christ 80 years ago and you still need the blood of Jesus today. It wasn't a one-time thing, it was a lifetime thing. And so as we're doing this, we want to remember the cost that Jesus paid for us. He paid it all. And we want to ask ourselves, Lord, what are you calling in me in my life where I'm at today? My age, my position, whatever. What are you calling for me? Because I want to recommit everything I have to you. The table of our Lord and Savior is open to all. It's freely given, and we are told to freely receive. Today's message is not about having to pay for what Jesus did. It's about adding our efforts and our pursuit and our thoughts and our goals and lining them all up with Jesus Christ who is our Lord and Savior. And so as we're taking today, remember his goodness to us, remember his love, our love started with him first loving us. And he has been so gracious throughout my whole life. I cannot say enough about his long suffering and his goodness and the power of his blood. We take the body that he gave for us. And the blood that covers sin, not just once a year like it used to in the old sacrifice, in the Old Testament, it covers for an eternity. And for the blood of the Lamb, we say thank you, Lord. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we just thank you this day. We do not want to leave this day with condemnation or guilt. We want to leave with freedom. And so we just invite you to speak into our lives. Help us to remember who's in charge and that it's a good thing that you are in charge. So we thank you for all your gifts, including your life and your blood. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.